when we understand that we were made in the image of God, right? Made for more and we live for more, what happens is your life becomes generative, right? You begin creating hope. You begin creating love. You begin creating faith in others. You begin creating opportunity. You begin creating future. Created on purpose and for purpose. Hey, welcome back to the Dare Another One podcast. We're here. Let's go. Where's the button? The, oh, crowd going wild. Sit down, folks, in the back. Just come on. That's enough. That's enough. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Got the buttons back. I love the buttons, right? Anyway, hey, welcome back to the Darren Early Wine Podcast. This is the last episode of the Renew series, and I'm stoked on it because uh, I think it's going to put a nice bow on uh, on this gift uh, to your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's what we're talking about today. Made for more, living for less. That's the title. That's the structure, the, the structure of the whole thing. And it's seated in this. This year, as I talked about, you know, the words of my year, right, were renew and receive. And this receive piece is is so big because uh, it's the other side of the coin. We, we we've we've renewed, right? we've replaced, we've had an encounter with the resurrected Christ, and now it's time to reclaim and receive what God has for us because He has so much for us. And this is going to be an absolute 95 mile per hour fastball right down the middle of what we talk about all the time on the podcast. Okay. Which is great. We're going to see it in some really good scripture. So, you know, it's like, this is just Darren talking about what Darren talks about. No, this is Darren talking about what the Bible talks about to help you understand that when now you're ready, right? You said, you got the place you said, God, I want to be renewed, right? I want to step into something new in this year. I want streams of living water flowing for me. I want fresh life. I want this. I got to replace some things. I've repented, right? I've changed my mind about some things. I've reshifted my, my, my priorities, maybe some habits, maybe some addiction type things. I'm bringing on some new tools, right? I'm seeking you with all my heart. I'm, I, I'm having that experience with the resurrected spirit of Christ. And now I'm ready to reclaim that which was lost. Because here's what happens. I, I want life. I want life to be a downhill situation for all the good stuff, right? I wish everything negative in life, I wish was a just uphill grind and everything positive was just downhill. Wouldn't that be great? I think about it. If everything great in life was easy and just a downhill uh, a glide, you just put yourself in neutral, right? Really no structure to life necessary. Just throw it neutral. It's like going through the, 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 uh, the uh, what's it called? The car wash, right? Don't you love going through the car wash? You pull in there, right? You got to get it straight. They're trying to know how to get, what I always say going through the car wash, and I go about twice a week, right? I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I just told Coop, Coop, no rabbit trail, no rabbit trail type stories here. Just hit a 20 minute podcast and shut up. And here I am talking about going through the car wash. But I go through the car wash and I hate it when they try to line you up, right? To get you in the tracks and then it's wrong, right? I'm like, bro, all you got to do, you're telling me go left. And then I jank my tire up, right? Because anyway, you get in there, but I love it. And they just say neutral, right? You put it in neutral, boom, you're cruising through. You get done, you get out, the car's clean. I wish life was like that. Put it in neutral, just cruise. Don't really try. Don't really stay focused. And you arrive at a amazing career, the best marriage you've ever seen. Your kids come out, they're pulled surprise winners, right? And say, how'd that happen? Oh no, it's just in neutral. My kids are amazing. Look, President of the United States, my kid. That doesn't happen, Right. All the, the 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 dangerous stuff in life. You want to you want to make your life a disaster? Just put it in neutral, and you'll slide right down the hill into destruction. The reality about life is all the good stuff is uphill. And what happens is whether it's like we talked about in the last episode, maybe it was grief, maybe it was fear, maybe it was it was disappointment. When we put ourselves in neutral and and we're no longer seeking God, we're just there. Here's the tough part: is that we're sliding backwards. We're losing ground. So what needs to happen now is, is we've got our head straight, we've got our heart straight, we've got our spirit straight over the past couple of episodes. Now it's time to reclaim that which was lost. And the great part about this is God is for you in this and he's already stacking the deck in your favor to move you forward. Because what, he, what, 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 he, what grieves him, what he wants to fix is this, when you were made for so much more, but you've been living for less. This is exactly what Paul jumps into in Ephesians chapter two. Let's go. I'm going to read it from the NIV first. It says it like this. As for you, that's us, right? You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler, right? Of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also 
lived among them at one time, gratifying, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Listen to the way it says it in the message paraphrase. I love this take on it. It says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. These first three verses here in, in Ephesians chapter two are, are, are breaking down for us like the essence, right, of sin, right? The essence of sin, basically being made for more and living for less. And we've been here. Maybe you're there right now. We get to the place where I love the way it says it there in, in the message paraphrase, right? We let the world tell us that I know the first thing about living, how to live. It says we inhaled, right, unbelief and exhaled disobedience. I think it's Tim Keller says this, that, that sometimes the coping mechanisms we use to live apart from God, that's a great definition for sin. And what happens in that is we get these coping mechanisms. Like, I'm not sure I'm going to stay connected. I don't know what's going on here. So I try to cope with, with what I actually need for my soul. And those things I put in the in-between space, they begin to be the things uh, that, that, uh, that, that destroy my life. They bring me to the place where, I'm, where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm satisfied with less in my life, which brings me to the place of needing renewal. And we've talked about a covenant triangle here before on the podcast. And I'm going to have Coop put a graphic up if you're watching uh, on, on, on YouTube. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing on YouTube. I'm going to pull up the, 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 uh, the picture of the a covenant triangle so I can talk through this. If you're just listening, right, you're going to have to use your imagination, but I believe in you. You can do it, right? And in the covenant triangle, uh, which uh, I've, uh, I'm going to thank Mike Breen once again for, for teaching me this many, many years ago because it's been foundational for me. Basically, if you look at the triangle, the top of the triangle, we can put the word God or we can put the word Father. And when God is at top, right, when, when, when he's on top of the situation because he is because he's God, right, what happens is everything flows in the right pattern. When, when, when Paul talks about there, like we let the world that doesn't know the first thing about living tell us how to live, what often we do there as well is we allow when we don't have God on the top of that situation, right? When we're inhaling disbelief, I don't believe in God, I don't think there's a God, what begins to happen is what flows down to us is, is other sources that don't know how to actually teach us how to live. Because the first thing that God actually does there in the covenant triangle, you'll see, is that it goes God, right, or Father. And then, and if you go down uh, the, the, uh, the right side, if you're looking at the right side of the triangle, you see identity. And that's what God is trying to do, right? When we're, when we're made for more but living for less is God understands our identity, who he's made us to be like in relationship with him, in partnership with him. All of these great things are gonna give us faith and hope and love and purpose and passion and peace. He knows that. And when he's on top and we place him on top, he, he forms our sense of identity. And out of that, you'll see in the triangle, flows our, our, be, our obedience. So our, our, our belief and who he says we are, right, our, 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 our belonging to him flows out to us becoming, through our obedience, more connected to God, which drives us up into greater intimacy with God. But when we're made for more but living for less, here's what we do. We take God off the top of that triangle and we substitute a lot of different things. The way he says it, right, we let the world tell us how to live. And, and, and that can look like a lot of different things. And so that's the question I have for you is who is telling you how to live? And, and by, by that, who is telling you what your identity is? Some of us listen to our failures. You can put failures on top of that triangle. And the failures say, you're a loser. You're a sinner. You're no good. You're a failure. Whatever it is, right? Some of us decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going I'm to allow my successes to tell me who I am. So you, you, you measure yourself by your 401k, your paycheck, or your car, or your vacation house, or whatever it is, and you, you are your successes. That's a dangerous place, obviously, because uh, when the job doesn't come through or things begin to fall off, then you're left in a place of going, I have no idea who I am because I was defined by my success. Some of you have been defined by your parents. Some of you allow your, your ex-husband or ex-wife to, to define you. Some of you allow uh, TikTok, right? Social media to define you. 
I think that's one of the difficult things in 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 this this next generation, who, the generation that has never lived in a time when social media didn't exist. If they don't have a good concept of understanding their heavenly father and how much he loves them and what Paul's laying out here in the truth, right, is they're allowing random people on TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever it is, Instagram, right, to tell them who they are and who they're not. And when God is not at the top of that triangle and our, we're not inhaling belief in him, what's happening is we're inhaling disbelief and we're exhaling disobedience. And when we look at that idea, the other side of the triangle, where it doesn't say obedience, it says disobedience. And what we find then, right, is we find ourselves living for less. And what that looks like a lot of times is a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of loneliness, right, anger, bitterness, we can go on and on and on that become what we settle for in life. Why? Because we've allowed someone that did not create us, doesn't sustain us, doesn't love us, doesn't know how to guide and direct. We've allowed them to actually tell us who we are. If you're going to live the life God's created you to live, you have to live your life knowing this. The only person who has the ability to actually tell you who you are, your core identity, is the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God that died for you, the God who came back from the dead for you, the God that sent his living spirit within you to give you what you need to become who you were born to be. You got to put God back on that circle, right? And, and one of the ways I think we begin to see this is if our life becomes a life of consumption or a life of creativity, right? Is when I see people who, who live lives really far from God, they're made for more, but they're living for so much less. What happens is, is their life becomes a life of consuming, right? They consume people through manipulation, narcissism, sex, uh, lies, whatever it could be. Like they're not there to be generative and give to people. They consume people like, like a product. Okay. Another piece of that is, is, is we consume, uh, we consume, um, food, drugs, alcohol, money, whatever it could be. What happens is we become somewhat like a black hole in this world. When God's not telling us who we, who we are, when that identity is not solid, we settle for so much less and the, the fruit of that is a life that consumes. When we understand that we were made in the image of God, right? Made for more and we live for more, what happens is your life becomes generative. Right? You begin creating hope. You begin creating love. You begin creating faith in others. You begin creating opportunity. You begin creating the future. Right? I've used Irwin's quote so many times on this. Like, what do human beings uniquely create? We uniquely create futures, but we only do that when we stop settling for living for less. When we actually put God back on the top of that triangle and say, God, I'm only going to believe who you say that I am. And here's the good news is he actually allows that to happen, right? We're made for more. And here's what, here's the thing. And we're forgiven for much. Let's get back to the word. Paul goes on, right? Start picking up in verse four. But because, right, God could have done away with this. He could have gotten mad about the whole thing when we replace him at the top of the triangle. But he says, no, because of his great love, God who was rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved, right? You didn't do anything to actually deserve this. It says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let me hit you with the message paraphrase of this. I love this too. It says this, instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he, speaking of God, embraced us. He took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ, right? Made for more and forgiven for much, right? It says he did all of this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in the company of Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work, 
All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the for saving, and the saving, right? Here's the deal. If we're going to be, if we're going to be the place where we're going to, we're going to be understand that we're made for more and that we're going to live for more, we've got to understand how forgiven we are, right? And, and, and starting in this, I don't know if you're into daily affirmations. I don't do them a ton, but I come back to them often, right? How often do you remind yourself who God says that you are, right? When you start to feel shame coming in and saying, oh man, you screwed up that relationship. Oh, well, you're just a failure, right? When, when other sources on the top of that triangle begin to tell you who you're not, how often do you come back and say, no, you know what? God, right? God is in control. He loves me. You know what God says? Right, I just read it, right? God says, I am forgiven. God says, I'm saved. God says that I'm loved. God says that, that he, he, he set it up to begin to lavish his love and goodness on my life. Like I am the recipient of God's love, forgiveness, grace, power, strength, joy. I'm redeemed. Right? That's a word you may hear in, in the Bible, you may hear it at church, but it means this, to regain possession of something in exchange for payment. You see, for us to actually begin to, to understand that I'm made for more, I'm going to live for more, I've got to understand that point. Is what Jesus did on the cross from dying, coming back from the dead, is he regained possession of you. He took your sin dead alive when you were separated from him. And he said, listen, I'm regaining possession, meaning that you were created. You were made for more. And how you were made for is you were, you were made to be God's possession. Like not in, 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 in some uh, demeaning way, but that you're his. And you're forgiven, you're saved, you're redeemed, you're brought into that. And so for us to understand like the enormity of the gift of grace that we've been given, we have to understand the enormity of the gift of creation that we really were made for more. And that's the process that God's taken us to. He made us in his image, right? He made us for an eternal relationship with him. He created us to create. He designed us to, uh, to design, right? He made us to rule, to partner with him, to actually see his kingdom come and his will be done. And if we don't get to the place where we realize I've been redeemed to actually reclaim that which the, the devil and sin and all these things try to take from me, we won't step into the future that God has for us with the kind of passion in the, in the kind of peace, the kind of purpose that, that, that he has for us. Sometimes it's tough to believe though, right? And uh, I've come back to this quote from Marion Williamson quite a few times, but I think it's so true, right? Where it says this, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, which is I think where we want to stay sometimes. Ah, I just, I'm, not, I'm not like you, Darren, I can't talk, or I'm not like Coop, I can't do video, or I'm not like this person, I can't sing, I can't dance, I'm not that smart, I don't... And we try to hide behind that fear, right? Like, I'm just inadequate. But Miriam says this, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fa fabulous? Well, actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God, right? You're made for more. This is what she says here. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And I think that's where we've got to get to the way we realize like I made for more. I've been living for less. I made for more. I've been forgiven of much. So now here's what I can do. I can actually step into who I was created to be because there's now no barrier between me and God, right? I've been renewed, right? I, I've repented. I've come to a place where I'm, re I'm, I'm ready to actually meet him, connect with him, and then reclaim that which was lost. And a lot has been lost. 
right? This world is not in a good place right now. And guess what? We're not going to wait for the government or for educational systems or, or entertainment systems, like these other spheres of life to somehow come in and begin to tell us and, and, and create how the world should actually operate, where, where, where peace and love and kindness and gentleness and patience, these things actually shape families and communities and schools and churches and governments. Here's the deal. It, we are God's answer. You are made for more and you are made to rule with and join with God to create the future that's currently on his heart, on his mind. But if you don't believe that, you will settle for less. Michelangelo, right? The, 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 the inventor, the creator, like that, that guy, right? Not the Ninja Turtle Michelangelo. He says this, the great danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. I love that quote. I've shared it with you before, but I'm concerned that's where you're at is you've been made for so much, but you've settled for so much less and you've dropped your, 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 your actual goal of what you think your life could be under something that might actually be achievable by your own efforts. Listen, listen I don't want to live a life that I can pull off, right? Like get me out on the edge where my fear starts to really battle with me. We're like, I don't think I can actually show up and do this unless God shows up. That's exactly where we're supposed to be because that's exactly what we were made for. That's why it's so key. And I'm going to land it with this is, is how Paul ends it. The last verse here, one of my favorite verses of the Bible. I quote this to you all the time. You probably haven't memorized if you listen a lot to the podcast. If you don't have this scripture memorized, make it a point to memorize this scripture and say it to yourself all the time. Because here's the deal. You are made for more. We're done for living for less. You are made for more and you are forgiven by much. And here's the deal. You were made for more and you are made to be a living masterpiece. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, with works which God prepared in advance for us to do. The message says it like this. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he's gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing, right? You're the workmanship, the handiwork of God created him to do good. He's already prepared in advance. It's waiting for you, right? You're made for more and the more is literally out there waiting for you to chase it down and create it. Stop living for less. And it's so cool that Paul uses the terminology he does here, right? That the, the word he uses there is po poemia. I don't know. I don't speak that language. It's close enough, right? Here's what it means. It means masterpiece. And the cool part about this is the, the Ephesians, right? He's writing to these people in the town of Ephesus and, and they were huge with artwork. They had this, um, they had all this artwork for their God, Artemis and stuff like this. And so they would have understood this when he's talking about art, they were really into it, right? And so he's saying, just like you guys love art, that is how I want you to see your life, that your life is a masterpiece. But if God's not on the top of the triangle and you're not allowing him to tell you who you are and out of what he says, you believe that and then start becoming what he says you already are, you will settle for less and the world doesn't need less of you. The world needs all of you. Your family needs all of you right? Your church, your community, your company, your marriage, your kids, they need the masterpiece that God has created you to be. So it's time for you to start inhaling belief and exhaling the future. Man, oh man. I know there's some people, right? You, you, you listen to a lot of podcasts. People probably have their favorite scriptures they talk about all the time. And, and there's sometimes that I feel like, man, am I really going to come back to Ephesians chapter two again? Like maybe some of you guys, I haven't gotten the email yet. I'm probably going to get it now. Like, Darren, do you know there's other chapters in the Bible? Do you know there's other books? Yes, I know there's other books in the Bible. Okay. But there's such rich truth that we need to hear in the second chapter of, of Ephesians. Because I would say, what I encounter the most with people is they absolutely struggle to believe that they were actually made for more and so they settle for less. And I'm not saying that this means your, 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 your life is going to be, be you know, void of, con of, of, of struggles, of conflict, of problems. No, it's going to be there. 
But that's why, right? Like 365 times the Bible tells us to be strong or courageous. That's why we're told that we're more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, right? That's why we're told that we can persevere because the perseverance, right, actually begins to develop character and character hope. Like so much of the Bible just keeps undergirding what God wants us to know is like, listen, let, let, let me tell you who, who you are. I created you, right? Pastor Ken Primo at Northeast that I work with, he had a great illustration. I'll end with this. Where he said, you know what is interesting is that we want to name our own kids. Like all my boys, right? Cole, Ty, Knox. All of their names, Julie and I came up with. We had some help. Some people said, hey, what about this name? What about this name? You know what I mean? But I didn't farm that out to other people. And every one of my kids, their name has some connection to our families. Right? And I don't know, you know what your name is, but my guess is your name may have some connection to legacy in your family. If you have kids, your kids probably have a name that has some kind of connection and, and you loved naming them. And, and here's the deal. Here's what I would really have a problem with. I think nicknames are kind of cool and stuff, but my problem would be is I name my son Cole and my son Ty and my name Knox. What I wouldn't want is somehow that my kids came home and, and they were like, hey, dad, yeah, there was this kid. He's new. He just moved from Kansas and uh, man, he showed up at school today. And I guess my name is like Steve now, right? And Cole started walking around his life saying, I'm Steve, I'm Steve, I'm Steve. Like that's who I am. Or, or, or even if some guy gave Cole a whole different narrative. Hey, Cole, you're, you're no longer you know, Cole Early Wine that was born to Julie and Darren Early Wine. And here's the legacy that you come with. And here's the, the, the structure of your life. Like what if my son came home one day and he said, hey, dad, here's the deal. New name and a completely different narrative right? I'm not connected to you anymore. I'm my own guy. My last name is this now. And I don't, I, I'm not connected to your DNA. I'm not connected to anything that's you. I, I basically have just kind of self-created myself. Like that would break my heart. And some of us are doing that. We're living a life that TikTok, our successes, our failures, you know, other people are trying to tell us culture itself to the point where some of us are beginning to actually believe that we're not human, right? And I'm not going to get into it today on the podcast, but that's what breaks my heart when I see a lot of the, the identity struggles in our culture. When people say, you know what? I think I'm probably a cat. No, like you're actually created in the image of God. You, you don't believe in God. And so you've replaced God at the top of the triangle. And now any, anything works. You know, I just, I, I, I want to be a loving person. I think it's interesting. Sorry, Coop, we're not hitting the 20 minute mark because now I'm on a roll. Okay, here's the deal. This breaks my heart too, is I see so many people, right? Who are so afraid to have kids. Have you noticed that? I know 20 somethings, they're getting married and they're, they're just, I'm not sure if we're going to have kids, right? We're, but we're, we're dog, we're dog people, right? So we've got, we've got our, our fur babies our fur babies. And so we've got two, two dogs in, and we love them. And we kind of want to become like our dogs because they're, they're man's best friend. I mean, if you're honest, right They're they're better than, than kids. Okay. Here's the problem with that. Like when I talked about the idea that when we, when we're settling for less, made for more, but living for less, our life becomes more consumptive than generative and creative. So yeah, you know what? Dogs are great. And it is kind of great to be loved by a dog, but you weren't put on earth to be a dog lover. You were put on earth to be someone who creates, right? Your life isn't meant to just consume. And then maybe somebody says, you know what? I, I just kind of, I, I wish I could love like a dog loves. So I, I'm going to tell myself I'm a dog now. I'm going to live like a dog because I want to love like a dog. That's going to be a really difficult life for you because you're settling for so much less. Like I love my dog, Theo, but I don't want his life, right? Theo can't help solve the greatest problems of the world. Theo eats the same freaking brown pellets twice a day, right? If he has for eight years, and then he lays on the couch all day long, staring at the wall. That's called jail. That's called solitary confinement. I don't want Theo's life, Right. I want to actually join together with the God who, who, who knit me together in my mother's womb and had great plans to put me on this earth and then actually filled me with the spirit and gave me abilities and, and a spiritual DNA to partner with him to help see his kingdom come and his will be done. Like, I don't want to be just someone who receives love. I want to be someone who creates love for others. I want to be someone who creates hope for others. I want to be somebody that creates faith for others. Like, that is what we do when we join together with God. But if we don't believe who God says we are, we will never do it. Don't settle for less. You are a masterpiece. 
created in the image of God, to join God, to create the future that's currently on his heart and his mind. Soapbox over. Podcast over. Listen, you got to believe it. And it's time to receive it. It's time to begin to reclaim that which was lost and step out to create the future that he's prepared in advance for you to create. I believe in you. Love you. Thanks for downloading this episode. God's for you, not against you. He's near you, not far. He's created you on purpose and for a purpose. We'll see you guys next time on the Darren Lee Wine Podcast.